Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hudson First United Methodist Church online worship service. And I'm so excited that you are here. We're going to talk a little bit about the tares and the wheat. We're talking about who is our enemy. But most of all, we're going to be worshiping the Lord. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, and let's worship the Lord together. Interesting. This is a uh, old characters made for a TV movie back in around 1978 or something. Coward of the County, and uh, is this Kenny Rogers? He's a Southern Baptist uh, minister, and um, he's talking about uh, turning the other cheek and let them smite you on their other cheek. So he's telling his congregation this, and you know, there's people who are skeptical. This guy is just like, you know, okay, whatever. But what he does is he actually invites somebody. He invites them up. He goes, "Come on up here. I'm going to let you." So let's give an example of this. I'm gonna, I want you to smite me on the cheek. He goes, I just want you to give it all you got. Go ahead. The guy's like, are you serious? And he's like, come on, just give it to me. Smite me. So he, bam, he gives it to him. <laughs> and so you see he's about to come after him. The guy's like, hang on now, hang on there. And he's like, it's all good, man. It's all good. You see, we can turn the other cheek. I got a kick out of that. I had to share it with you. Well, welcome to Hudson First United Methodist Church online worship service. Grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I am um, working with a little bit of an allergy uh, reaction. My right eye is, maybe it looks left on yours, but my right eye is um, reacting to something. I woke up with, uh, it was half open, half closed, however you want to put it, if you're an optimist or not. But uh, so it was red and it was it was nasty, but I... So it's uh, doing better in case you notice that in the service. It looks, um, yeah, it's a little off. Anyhow, so it's getting better though. It's a lot better from when I woke up. So that's a good sign. However, let's go on with our worship service. Uh, my name is Brian Comiskey. I'm the pastor here at Hudson First United Methodist Church. Grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that you've come to worship with us today and welcome back if you've been here before. And it's wonderful to worship the Lord on this day. And I'm so thankful that we're able to get together in this way. Those who cannot join us here at Hudson First, we can worship this way. I'm so thankful for you. And I feel so blessed that you're here. Uh, I just wanted to mention, we're talking a little bit about um, the terrorists in the wheat. We're talking about who is my enemy. And we're talking about this is idea that is God a vengeful God? We're not going to get into that too much, but um, how we have to feel like we have to repent or else we're going to go to hell. Uh, we have to follow these rules. Um, and I know we have to uh, rely on the Lord and Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that, but I'm just thinking about an incident that my wife shared with me. She was at a McDonald's a few days ago, and there was an older woman with, and a younger woman there. And the younger woman was crying her eyes out and whatever the situation was. And we don't know for sure, but it was almost, Elizabeth said, it was almost the impression that uh, I'm going to take you out for lunch and you can tell me all about your problems because you're obviously upset about something. Well, the girl's crying her eyes out and the woman is telling her, well, you need to repent or else you're going to go to hell. Isn't she repenting? She's crying her eyes out, you know? I mean, we got to be careful about, as Christians, we have to... Um, just be careful about what we say and how we treat people, especially in those moments, trying to hit somebody when they're weak. Is, isn't that what Satan does? I'm not trying to call the woman Satan. I'm just saying, but doesn't Satan hit us at a, our weakest point to try to manipulate us? And so when we do that, on the flip side, isn't that manipulation? I don't know. We've got to be careful anyway. It just, it just rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I don't want to say he's not. I'm just saying we have to be careful in how we treat others and how we come to them in their moments of pain and sorrow and hurt. We have to be loving, but let's not shove anything down anybody's throat. That's not the way we're going to convert anybody to Christ. I hope not anyway. So, ha, that's all. I, that's all I got for now. So let's go on with our service. Let's go to our call to worship. Here, I'll have it up on the screen for you. 
Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That is based on Matthew 7, and that is the uh, word of God for the people of God, and ends our first scripture reading for today. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. And I just realized how appropriate that was with my eye. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Oh, uh, who am I judging, man? I guess maybe I was judging that lady. Maybe that's why this happened. Oh my gosh, you know, you've got to be careful. Anyway, <laughs> our opening hymn is uh, Gather Us In, so the words will be up on the screen, and let's sing along together. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, will you join me in prayer? Lord, we welcome you today in worship and praise. Praise for the amazing love and grace you give us. We ask you to teach us your ways. Guide our hearts that we may love in the same way that you love, Lord, as best as we can. Even the ones who have hurt and harmed us, help us to pray for those people. Though our wounds and our deep Help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. Lord, when you were up on the cross and you said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Wow, if we could only love so deeply, Lord, help us to love others the way you love us. And we ask this in the name, in your powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading is going to be Exodus number 23 verses four through five. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Moving on to the second portion of our scripture reading. Leviticus number 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, let's move on to our um, prayer time. And during this prayer time, let's remember those who can really use just our thoughts, those who are uh, coming up as we take a little bit of silent time in the beginning, let's take a moment to just sit in silence and, and think about those who we can pray for. Let's think about those uh, situations that are on our hearts and we can think about those who are, um, the situations that are in the world. Let's take a moment of silence. So if only to just sit in the peace and the serenity of the Lord our God. If you need more time to sit and meditate or pray silently, you are welcome to pause at this time. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are gracious beyond measure, clothed in majesty. You are mighty, yet you save with mercy. Heavenly, almighty God, you are an exquisite creator with hands that carve out beauty. You are the author of life, yet you give us such freedom. We Thank you for the freedom to choose so that we can choose you in our freedom. We can reach out to you because we're learning that we can't do it without you, Lord. You know each and every one of us intimately. Your heart is so full of love Yet you watch over us and see our weaknesses, and you guide us daily, Lord. You don't take pleasure in our death. You don't take pleasure in our pain. But you allow us to come to you, and you allow everything to work toward your good. Ultimately, every knee shall bow. But we draw near to you, and we drink in the promise of eternity. We draw near to you and walk with you and seek your guidance as we learn to be more loving. Dear Lord, in your sanctuary, we are safe. In your harbor, we are safe because we are saved in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're safe to let down our guard and dwell in your truth, Lord. We 
just ask that you continue to come forth in our lives and as you have done and saved us time and time again. Help us to get past our weaknesses, Lord, and overcome them in your name, for that is the only way we could ever do it, by your strength. Lord, you are a God of wholeness. We ask forgiveness that we have fallen. And you knew we were going to fall, Lord. But you also know that we are working our way back to you. And Lord, we ask that you continue to go before us, guide us, pull us in the right direction. We give you thanks for the spirits and the angels that guide us, Lord. Thank you for your guidance and for the guidance of our Lord Jesus Christ as we overcome our obstacles and give us the strength to overcome these things in our lives. Lord, help us to reach out to others. Help us to minister to your world, Lord, that we can up, raise up the name of Jesus Christ and declare, this is how I was saved. This is how I overcome. It wasn't anything by myself. It was you who did it. It was the Lord God Almighty and the Son, Jesus Christ who gave us the strength, who gave us the will and the power by overcoming the world. You have given us the strength, Lord, by your strength, by your mercy and power to overcome in this world. So we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer today. We pray for our communities. We pray for our churches. We pray for our schools. Let there be peace on earth, Lord. Let us work with one another. Let us resolve our differences in your name, Lord. You did not create us to fight amongst each other. You created us to live in peace, harmony amongst our differences. Lord, you made us different. When we decide to fight against our differences, Lord, we are just administering against who you are and what you are, Lord, and who you created us to be. So again, Lord, please forgive us for that, but help us to continue to move forward in your strength, in your love, in your peace, in your mercy. Help us to give that others. Help us to have a mind of mission. Help us to reach out as often as we can to show your love. We ask this in Jesus' name today as we say the prayer you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for praying with me today, and thank you for praying together, because we're in this together. So wonderful, wonderful, uh, absolutely awesome that you are here with us and praying and worshiping. And well, I, when it comes to worship, let's go to the next scripture reading. And it is Matthew 13. Last week we did a, um, an outdoor service, so we didn't have an online service, I do apologize. Uh, it was an outdoor service, we had Jesus teaching from the, um, from the boat on the water. So we were actually at a pond, or rather a lake, Lake Bobbies in Hillsdale, Michigan. And we had a good turnout, I was very impressed that everybody came and I wasn't sure about that, but they came and uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful um, singing and um, just a lesson with Jesus, he would say a parable on the boat, and I was on the shore, and I would explain the parable a little bit. And then Jesus would tell another parable, but he was on the boat, and he was dressed like Jesus, Dr. Dan. It was awesome. <laughs> it was great. If you know Dr. Dan, you know how awesome that, that actually is, that he played Jesus. So anyhow, well, let's go to our scripture reading. It is Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, did you sow good seeds in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said, because while you are pulling the weeds, 
you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, there is um, more to that story. I thought I put it on there, so I'm going to read. <laughs> Excuse me, there's more to that scripture. Let me just uh, pull it up here. This, isn't, um, this wasn't planned. I'm not doing some kind of weird skit or anything like that. I'm actually looking because I thought I, I meant to add the rest of the parable or the explanation of the parable found in Matthew 13. So let me pull that up here. Matthew 13. Okay. All right. 36 from Matthew 13, verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. And there you go. That is the, uh, the rest of the, that's the rest of the story. Is it? But anyway. <laughs> well, I was thinking about, um, there was a particular pastor that I used to attend church at, and he was very good at, giving a sermon, and I always appreciated his gestures and his voice inflection, and he had meaningful pauses. Just kidding. But one time he actually did pause too long. He gave a point, and it was like forever. His pause kept going and going. And um, after the service, I said, what was with that long pause, man? You know, I, I like to you know, kind of watch you in that sense and see how you do, and I always kind of learn from you in that way. But that was a long pause. I don't know if that was effective. And he goes, well, that was because a police officer walked in and took somebody out during that moment. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it was behind me. I guess I didn't notice it. But yeah, that was um, interesting. So that was funny. That, that's not a joke. That's a true story. Uh, anyway, but not that I would tell any jokes here, but there was another pastor who was talking about his uh, other situations um, about in his congregation while he's given a service. Like, for one, for one instance, he was in the middle of his sermon, and he noticed a man had fallen asleep. on a, He put his head on his wife's shoulder, and he was snoring away. Well, he just couldn't take it anymore. He snapped because he hadn't seen enough of this. And so he said, hey, wake up your husband. You know, totally called him out. And the wife said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. Well, that's one instant, but there was another pastor, actually, that was giving a sermon on loving your enemies, and he asked the congregation to raise their hands if they had enemies. And everybody, of course, did so, except for Mrs. Watson right down here on the front row, who had just turned 95. And he said, Mrs. Watson, how could you possibly live 95 years and have no enemies? She said, that's easy. I've just outlived them. And there you go. <laughs> I could see that, but... If you were at the service on Sunday, though, over, I was talking about the Bobby's Lake ser uh, um, service, excuse me, we were doing, um, we already talked about this particular scripture a little bit, the wheat and the tares. And I told my wife, I said, I was preaching on that again. And she said, again? And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, again. And I said, I only talked about it for a few minutes. She goes, well, that's how long your sermon should be, in just a few minutes, but... I'm just kidding. She didn't say that, but I did feel convicted because she's right. I, can, I guess I do bring up the 
the parable of the tares and the wheats. Wheats, tares, and the wheat. And that's because it's such a vital point, I feel, in Jesus' teaching. The enemy did this. The enemy did this. You didn't do this. The enemy did this. And you are not the enemy. And I talk about it so much because I think it's that important. So many people are buried under the tremendous weight of guilt or discouragement or the feeling of little or no self-worth. But it wasn't from you. An enemy did this. And we think that we are the problem. On the other hand, we might have somebody that lets us know, here, you're right, it's not my fault. Let me tell you about everybody who's responsible for the trouble in my life. Here's a list. Here's a list for you. <laughs> oh, just love to tell you about it. It's the other end of the spectrum, right? It's the other extreme. But anyway, but the sin in our lives are not from us, and they don't define who we are. Now, I used to work with a gal in a restaurant quite a few years ago. It was a long time ago. She was nice enough, but she always seemed to define people by their past mistakes, and it just drove me up the wall. I'm sorry, but it was a small town, so of course everybody kind of knew a lot of other people, and she knew a lot of people, and I know small towns be like that. So of course she knew you know, this person, that person. I, she'd be like, hey, hi, George, and George would be like, hello, and he'd leave, and she'd be like, he's a, con a convicted felon. Or they'd be like, see that girl over there? Her name's Tracy. She got pregnant when she was 14. Like, so did Mary, Jesus' mother. <laughs> or, hey, that's Richard over there. He's an adulterer. Well, how do you know? Because it was with me. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what happened. But seriously, when we take what we think is the worst part of somebody's past and we make that who they are, it's just like we're deeming them unfit to live among the righteous. We judge them as the weeds among the weeds, and we leave them to burn. We cast them out of the village, or we stone them socially. And if we try to be their friend, you know, or, then your character gets questioned, and that's what happened when Jesus ate with those identified as unworthy. The religious leaders began to look down on him, this rabbi who broke bread with sinners. They began to see he was a rebel, and he was different, and he began to be a threat to their way of life. And therefore, he became an enemy to them. When we're born into this imperfect world, we take on this fallen inheritance. And it's funny, we all start out as babies, don't we? We all start out at the same place for the most part. We start out as babies. That, that pure, unadulterated state and that's why we love babies so much. You know, you hold a newborn baby, and they're so beautiful, usually. Sometimes they look like a little piece of wet bologna, but anyway, you know what I mean. They're innocent. It's like holding a little piece of heaven. We're very close to heaven in that moment when we're holding a newborn, and we cuddle it, and we have that feeling of pure joy. And that's heaven. We're experiencing heaven a little bit right there, and we usually don't think, you know, when we're holding it, we don't think like, ah. Oh. I wonder what sin or temptation this young child's going to have to deal with and that's going to torment them in their future. You know, we don't, we don't think like that. And that baby begins to grow up, and it's beautiful, and then it turns two years old. It's, they're still beautiful. And they bring you joy, and you couldn't imagine life without them. And then they get older, and you begin to wonder why you never appreciated nap time before. And moms out there, you start to reminisce about the days when you could go to the bathroom in peace without these little hands knocking on the door, or the fingers under the door crack, like it's a scene from the movie Signs or something. And so they get a little older, and they wake up in the morning, and they throw off the blanket, and they sing a good morning song. It's a new day, and you're like, ugh, coffee. But they're not even thinking about that. That's not even a thought because it's a new day and life is full of possibility and they're so full of energy. And I heard somebody say once that kids don't really sleep. They recharge. And then they go and play with other kids and it doesn't matter their differences. They just play. And then adolescence. And it's different. 
something changed. They wake up, they open their eyes, and they roll back over, and the parents go in there for the third time. Get up! So they groan and throw back their blanket, and they fall out of bed, slump down the stairs, and it could be all adults actually going to work in the morning. But anyway, they're like, I got to go to school. What happened? Where is the singing? Where did Barney go? Right? Wake up, good morning, celebrate, the sun is shining. But then we ask him also, like, what are you going to be when you grow up, Billy? Well, I, I'm going to be a firefighter. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a, a dancer. You know, no other kid ever said, when I grow up, I want to be an addict. When does that come in? It's the influence of the world, but I'm, ultimately it's the influence of the enemy. It's like the wheat growing up with the tares. We grow up with that influence, and then we become adults, and we see how bad the world is with all this man's inhumanity to man, disease, discord, poverty, and they say, that's all I hear about anymore. And then we don't play with, you know, play with anyone, just anyone anymore. Now we distrust people because by now we've been kicked around quite a bit. Where is that innocence from our childhood? And then our bodies hurt and we're mentally and spiritually exhausted and we say, where's this God you keep talking about? If God is in all, of all, ever-present and all-knowing, why doesn't he just get rid of the sin? If God is all-powerful, why doesn't he just root the sin right up out of our lives and out of the world? I mean, it's God. Why doesn't he just get rid of the evil people in the world? Right? Kill them, like in, that, like in that video. I say we kill them. Well, it's because those two are God's children. We're all God's children. Even the souls that have gone to hell are God's children. And yes, God still loves them. And the reason they're in hell, get ready, here comes the punchline. The reason is because God created his children in freedom. God allows there to be a hell because he doesn't want us to walk around like little spiritual cloned robots without a will of our own, right? He wants our will to be his will, don't get me wrong, but he wants us to grow and learn and align our will to his and come to love him through this journey of life, but not just in our own way. That's why Jesus is the way. Jesus is the clarifying process in our lives that allows us to separate the good from the bad and start returning to that pure state of heaven it's not just because of the name of Jesus. You know, I mean, that's Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus, but don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is it's the love of Jesus, the perfection of who he is, the gift of salvation to the world by him overcoming the world and giving us the way to live, showing us the way to live, showing us mercy, showing us setting the example. And it's just not, I'm saved. I'm saved. Hey, I'm good from here, right? It's like love at first sight. People talk about love at first sight, and it may be true. Maybe there is love at first sight. We may fall in love fast. But learning to love someone more every day is a process. Falling in love with somebody and learning how to love them deeper and deeper is a process. Life is a process. Sanctification is a process. And it's important to remember, sin didn't come from God. Sin came from us. God didn't sit up in his workshop one day and be like, hmm, wow, this looks fun. Now let's see how they handle this. We'll toss it out there. No, of course not. But he allowed it because he is allowing us a choice to choose to love God, to choose heaven or hell. And if the Lord ripped that sin out of our lives, if he ripped the sin out of the world, that sin that we cling to so hard, our freedom would be gone. So yes, God loves us so much that he allows us to learn to love him and not be forced to love him. And this is the part of what Jesus teaches us in the parable of the tares and the weed. It's not just a story of the bad people in the world getting thrown into the fire of hell 
And God, you know, washes his hands of them. Got rid of them, you know. Because, you know, we do get to the end of the parable, and it's almost like, all right, the end of the parable is, you know, some people's favorite part. The wheat and the tares, they grow up together, and we got to deal with this. And the harvest time comes, presuming the second coming of Christ, and then the tares will be separated from the wheat, and the good will be separated from the bad, and they will be burned in the furnace for all eternity, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, finally, we're getting down to it now. We got the fire and brimstone, people. Those bad people that have grown up around us, those sinners, we who are good, I mean, you know, we're not perfect, but I'm not that bad. We're finally going to be able to get them to see, get to see what's coming to them. I mean, we're going to be standing up in the clouds of heaven with Jesus and pointing our finger and laughing. <laughs> That's what you get. Losers. I'm being silly, of course, but the question is, who deserves hell? Just the bad people? The weeds of the world who don't fit into our perfect field? We all deserve hell to a certain degree. But thankfully, we have Jesus who saves us. Have you ever wondered by what criteria God sends somebody to hell? And somebody might say, well, yeah, that's, that's what you're talking about. Those who never accepted Jesus as their savior. It's that simple. But really, is it that simple? It may be simple for somebody who grew up in a Christian home, a loving Christian home, but it's never that black and white. Somebody might say, I'm saved. And I'd say, that's awesome, but that doesn't mean you just get to go around and sin all you want because you have a free pass into heaven. You know, I think about myself, somebody who's a Christian who recognizes Jesus Christ as my savior and especially being a pastor, I feel like I'm more at risk to go to hell than somebody who's not a Christian. For whatever reason, they're not a Christian. I don't know, but because I know better. I know the truth. I know the dangers of this world and its temptations. I know that the enemy will sneak up at night, plant those tares, and I've been given a great wealth and salvation. Matthew 13, I've been handed the keys to the kingdom, and it's a huge responsibility. And I don't have any excuses. It's my responsibility to live my life as close to Christ as possible. And I want to do that. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail. But when I catch myself judging other people as if it was up to me who decides who goes to hell and who goes to heaven, who is acceptable to society and who is a weed, I need to remember that that is the enemy. An enemy has planted that thought that it's okay to play God. You know, we don't have to like everyone. We don't have to get along with everyone, but we are called to love one another, especially those we consider our enemies. Jesus said, for what good does it do you to love those who love you? There's no reward in that. Yeah, but they're annoying. Yeah, well, you're annoying sometimes to somebody else. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And you're going to have to grow up with the tares. You have to grow up through life with others who don't fit into our box, who don't seem to fit, at least we think shouldn't be in our field. I used to think that there was no story by Jesus about who was the enemy. You know, I thought, I wish there was a story like the Good Samaritan when the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my enemy? Or rather, who is my, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells them, surprise, surprise, the answer to your question is someone who you despise. Who is the most vile person to you? That is your neighbor. So really, it kind of does answer the question at the same time. Our enemy can be our neighbor, and we are called to love them. I said in the beginning, you are not the enemy, and the people who drive us up the wall and get under our skin, who make us burn with anger because for whatever reason they aren't, you know, they aren't the enemy either. You've got to remember, the devil is the enemy. The influence of hell is the enemy. 
And when we hate each other, especially to the point of blows, it brings a hellish delight to the real enemy. My friends, we are given this field called life. And no matter how much we try to keep our field free from outside weeds and influences, they're still going to come. The enemy is always looking to sneak them in there, right? Unfortunately, that's life in this world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And the people who we might consider the troublesome, the bad people, the ones who get under our skin, we've got to grow up with them. But God turns all things to his good. And so we can give thanks for those people, really, because they do help us grow spiritually and help us to learn to love even those who persecute us or torment us, maybe not physically, but by their very existence. Let's face it, we all have those people in our lives. And the so-called bad things of this world, the terrors, we have to deal with them. God isn't going to uproot the evil in our lives and take away our freedom to choose God, to choose love and mercy. But when we do make that choice, to love instead of fear, to say, I don't understand you, but you are my brother and sister created by the same God, and I love you. When we make the choice to look at them, not as an unwanted, useless weed, but someone that God put here for a purpose, just as we have been put here for a purpose, then we are the living example of Christ. We are overcoming the world. Jesus lived for us. Jesus died for us. Jesus overcame the world for us by the power of divine love. And because he did that, we are given the chance to overcome overcome loathing with love, to overcome fear with friendship, and to overcome judgment with mercy. Amen. Well, let's go to our uh, closing hymn today, shall we? Let's sing out today and uh, raise our voices to the Lord. The words will be up on the screen.
Get ready to go into God's world. Bring messages of hope and grace and forgiveness. As we have been blessed, may we bring blessings to all who we meet in this life, in the life to come. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Go now in peace. Bye-bye. We'll see you later. Thanks for uh, coming out uh, and worshiping with us. If you want to um, leave us a tithe or offering, go to the description. There is a, in the, in the, the uh, description below, and uh, leave us a, if you're welcome, there's a link there. So anyway, good to see you all. I can see you out there, and we'll see you soon. God bless you all. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>